Hi, this is Dr. Tony Dance. I'm a clinical epidemiologist from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. I'm here today to discuss the status of research on stem cell therapy in the Philippines. The purpose of this presentation is to inform policymakers, clinicians, and academics about problems we need to confront in trying to regulate this growing problem. In this talk, I would like to discuss the following. First, I would like to give a brief overview of stem cell therapy, then discuss why we need clinical trials, then discuss dilemmas that confront us, and finally, discuss how to move forward. Let's start with a brief overview of stem cell therapy. Stem cells are young, immature cells that have the ability to turn into different kinds of cells in the body. These young cells can be harvested from embryos, which is a very controversial source, from young cells in adults, for example, from the bone marrow, or they can be developed from specialized cells in adults, for example, fat cells. Given the right stimulus and environment, Young stem cells can turn into brain cells, blood cells, liver cells, and almost any kind of cell in the body. Stem cells grown in labs should be counted and tested for viability. When introduced into the human body, they have the potential to replace old dying cells and to restore our youth. They also have the potential to replace sick cells in various organs and therefore cure various diseases. Because of the potential for adverse effects such as causing cancer, however, it is vital that they be tested like drugs for both effectiveness and safety. Why do we need clinical trials to test stem cell therapy? If some senator or actor gets well, isn't that enough proof? Let me share a story with you. This is the story of a 75-year-old diabetic man who complained of leg pain on walking for the past three years. A few weeks before admission, the pain worsened and dark discoloration of his leg was noted. The patient was then admitted for critical limb ischemia, which means his leg arteries were clogged and the leg was in danger of getting amputated. Fortunately, the patient was given autologous stem cell therapy from the bone marrow and over the next three months, the pain disappeared, color returned, and an amputation was avoided. Does this treatment seem effective? It certainly does, but I haven't given you the whole story. This man was actually part of a group of 19 patients with the same diagnosis given the same treatment. 16 of these 19 patients avoided an amputation. Now, does it look effective? Maybe, but I still haven't given you the full story. In truth, there was another group of patients with the same diagnosis. Instead of stem cell therapy, they were injected with placebo or plain water. Surprisingly, 20 of these 21 patients avoided an amputation. And now, stem cell therapy doesn't look so effective. This story illustrates three types of studies to evaluate effectiveness. A case report where treatment looked 100% effective in a single case. A case series where treatment looked effective in only 80% of cases, 16 out of 19. And a clinical trial where effectiveness was 0% because the difference between treating and doing nothing was nearly 0%. We would not have known that treatment was ineffective if a proper clinical trial had not been done. So what happened? What are the problems with a testimonial or a case report? Well, there are four reasons why single patients given treatment can get better. One, Maybe the treatment worked, and this is what we usually hope. However, there are other reasons. Maybe it was a placebo effect or the psychological effect of the treatment being given. It could also be that the patient received other treatments. And finally, it is possible that the body healed itself. Spontaneous healing is a natural phenomenon. The body can get well on its own more than 90% of the time. 
Even far advanced cancer can regress spontaneously without surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. And this has been known for hundreds of years. And this is the beauty of the medical profession to which I belong. God heals and we charge. It's no wonder then that case reports have proliferated in the mass media. Knowingly or unknowingly, these testimonies by politicians, actors, and actresses serve as covert advertisements that lure the less privileged into a trap where they spend hard-earned money for something that doesn't work. Joe Kahn once said, I'm now a believer in stem cell therapy and the proof is me. This is sad because he paid tribute to case reports, the least credible form of evidence of effectiveness. And so we need to require clinical trials to protect our people and to make sure that treatments they receive are safe and effective. In the next several slides, I will share three dilemmas that face us when we enforce such a requirement. As I go through these dilemmas, I will also point out three pseudo-dilemmas that have distracted us and which we should not waste our time on. Let's start with methodology. How we do the trials. And first, a pseudo-dilemma. Dr. Samuel Bernal of the Medical City has always argued that we cannot do trials on stem cell therapy because by design, the treatment is different for every individual. In a recent statement, he said, how can you compare groups? How can you get meaningful data to randomize groups of patients when no two patients are the same? In my opinion, this is not worthy of debate. There are more than 200 international clinical trials on stem cell therapy going on at the present time. Sufficient proof that they can be done. The real dilemma is what we need to address. And one such problem is that stem cell therapy is actually very complex and composed of several separate processes involving collection of cells from healthy donors, processing, preservation, maybe administration of chemotherapy, and then infusion of stem cells into treated patients. Within each process, there are an infinite number of improvements that can be undertaken. If a positive trial is required before adopting each small improvement, most would be small, most would be rejected, and progress would be slowed down. The problem of the assembly line process is similarly faced by surgical procedures. And fortunately, many of the problems have been adequately addressed by our colleagues in surgery. McCulloch et al. in a paper entitled Randomized Trials in Surgery, Problems, and Possible Solutions proposed that clinical trials only be required when a clear clinically important choice exists between contrasting alternatives. For smaller changes, an industrial paradigm may be acceptable where variations in the assembly line are allowed and even encouraged so that the process becomes more efficient. Next, let's discuss some regulatory issues. First, the pseudo-dilemma. Are stem cells drugs that warrant FDA regulation? In the U.S., a federal court ruled in favor of the U.S. FDA, saying stem cells fall under the legal definition of drugs. In the Philippines, they fall under the definition of health products and are also under FDA regulation. This is a non-issue that deserves no further debate. The real dilemma pertains to the concept of innovative therapy. In an opinion published in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, Patrick Taylor describes innovative therapy as an exception to the requirement of clinical trials. He said, innovative therapies are novel medical interventions radically different from the standard of care provided in order to benefit a patient rather than to acquire new knowledge. He further says, innovative therapies are often devised by clinicians 
not by basic science researchers. The example Taylor uses of innovative therapy is the first open heart surgery ever done. In 1938, a surgeon named Robert Gross operated on a young girl for a congenital heart disease. His department chairman had not allowed this innovative procedure, so Gross had to perform it while the chairman was away. Fortunately, the procedure was successful and Gross became known as the father of cardiac surgery. In this photo, he poses 25 years later with Lorraine Sweeney, the little girl he operated on and whose life he saved. Such innovation would not have been possible if we insisted on clinical trials all the time. Of course, Taylor does not tell us of other innovative surgeries such as hemicorporectomy for pelvic malignancy, which was severely disfiguring and carried a high mortality rate. He did not tell us of colectomy for chronic fatigue syndrome, or even more recently, radical mastectomy for breast cancer, which is hardly ever done. Clearly, the dilemma is how to balance the opportunity to innovate and the need to protect our patients from harm. Fortunately, some guidance is offered by the International Society of Stem Cell Research. They state that clinician scientists may provide unproven stem cell-based interventions to at most a very small number of patients outside the context of a formal clinical trial provided that, among others, there is a commitment by clinician scientists to use their experience with individual patients to contribute to generalizable knowledge. This includes, again, among others, moving to a formal clinical trial in a timely manner after experience with at most a few patients. In short, innovative therapy is an exception to clinical trials, but it is a provisional exception, and trials will eventually need to be done. This exception cannot be given in perpetuity. Finally, let's discuss some difficult moral issues. First, the pseudo-dilemma. Secretary Ona was recently quoted as saying, we cannot completely adopt Western practices of offering investigational therapies completely free to clinical trial participants. This approach will not only be unaffordable for our institutions, but very expensive. This is very depressing to hear from our Secretary of Health. But in my opinion, this is an issue not worthy of discussion. Patients offer their lives to science by joining clinical trials. It is unethical to also make them shoulder the cost. Cost should be properly shouldered by government or academe. If a study is ever approved that makes patients pay for investigational therapy, we should all get up in arms and crucify the investigators. Now a real moral dilemma. Consider the case of a 38-year-old female suffering from far advanced liver cancer that is inoperable and unresponsive to any form of chemo or radiotherapy. Can she be offered stem cell therapy? Or should this be restricted because there are no clinical trials? The dilemma. Are we protecting her from false hope? Or are we denying her her only hope? We can debate this forever, but at the end of the day, the decision is not ours to make. This is a decision to be made by the patient in consultation with the physicians she trusts. This case is an example of compassionate use, which, like innovative therapy, is one instance where we do not insist on trials. Like innovative therapy, however, compassionate use cannot be done in perpetuity. The Helsinki Declaration describes the requirements for compassionate use. In the treatment of a patient where proven interventions do not exist or have been ineffective, the physician, after seeking expert advice, with informed consent from the patient or a legally authorized representative, may use an unproven intervention 
if in the physician's judgment it offers hope of saving life, re-establishing health, or alleviating suffering. Where possible, this innovative treatment should also be made the object of research designed to evaluate its safety and efficacy. Finally, how do we go forward? Here, I may have some conflict of interest. As a researcher, I believe that the way forward is through research and regulation. A quick search through the National Library of Medicine database shows that in the past 25 years, there were 121,428 studies on stem cell therapy. Of these, 378 were randomized clinical trials. However, we are facing a boom. In this year alone, more than 200 clinical trials have been registered with the NIH. Involvement of the Philippines, of course, is zero. This is not surprising given our permanent insistence on compassionate use and innovative use. As the top users and prescribers of stem cell therapy, it is an international embarrassment that we have not contributed to a single study that will advance knowledge. Meanwhile, pending results of these clinical trials, the FDA should flex its muscle and strengthen its ability to regulate the practice of stem cell therapy. They should make sure that no Filipino patient should undergo treatment with stem cell therapy for indications when safety and effectiveness have not been proven. In summary, I've discussed what stem cell therapy is, why we need trials. I've talked of three dilemmas and three pseudo-dilemmas pertaining to methodologic, regulatory, and moral issues. And I've talked about the way to move forward through research and regulation. The title given to me when I was invited to give this talk was Stem Cell Therapy, Where's the Research? My brief answer is that research is everywhere but not in the Philippines. We should add, where's the regulation? Surely we all agree that regulation is needed. If we want our country to move forward, then not everything should be more fun in the Philippines. Again, this is Tony Dance of the UB College of Medicine. Thank you for your attention.